So now that we're back, why don't we start with Marlo? Why don't we? So after a woefully brief rest at your sanctum, you head out and arrive at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, which is where your mother has been a uh, semi-permanent guest for the last few years. Um, I, I assume that you've been here frequently enough that the hospital staff sort of knows maybe not who you are, but uh, why you're here, who you're here to visit. So you don't really have nurses asking you uh, for information or being like, hey, put some shoes on or, or anything like that. I've got rags, it's rag shoes. Don't assume I'm shoeless. <laughs> Shitty <laughs> shoes, but they're shoes. They've just got, they, oh, they're like the, the hospital staff are just sort of used to your presence. Yeah, they, they know. They know I'm. They know I'm the son coming to visit, and it's fucking. It's a normal thing. It's been a normal thing. So you make your way down, you know, past reception and down the hallway towards the room in which your mother is located. Uh, as you step through the open doorway, that's when you see her, Marianne Hosp. Her face heavily lined from decades of hardship. Her hair stark white and almost as wild and unkempt as your own. She's currently sitting up in her hospital bed listening intently as a nurse reads aloud from the morning newspaper. On the table beside her, you see a tray of food that looks mostly untouched, as well as a vase of slightly wilted flowers left behind from a previous visit. As you step in, the nurse is the first to notice you. She trails off from her reading and hands off the newspaper to Marianne before getting up to exit the room, giving you a friendly smile and a pat on the shoulder as she walks past you. Marianne turns her head to look at you and smiles warmly. What do you do? I go over and I, I'm assuming take a seat. I'm assuming there's a chair in here next to her. Say hey, Mom. Marlo, I was beginning to think that you'd finally forgotten about me. And she kind of reaches out and uh, ruffles your hair like she used to when you were a kid. You watch as her eyes sort of drift back down to the newspaper in her lap. The The headline is... An ongoing story about uh, the war and Europe, and she suddenly looks a lot more crestfallen. <sighs> what has this world turned into? Yeah, not so great times, I suppose. And to think, we've had to experience this twice now in both our lifetimes. If I'm being honest, I suppose I always knew something like this would happen again, but I guess I had always hoped that by the time it did, I would have already been long gone from this world. <laughs> Is that selfish of me, do you think? No, no. It's, it's, it's understandable. It'd be nice to be somewhere else sometimes. Anywhere else. You know, if given the choice, I'd probably just settle for being able to get out of bed. <laughs> mm. Ah, But enough about these old bones. Marlo, how have you been? Keeping well, I hope? Uh, things might be a little rough to come for me, too, I think. Might not be so good. Trouble at the office again? Something like that, yeah. Some guys breathing down my neck, but maybe that'll pass, too. You really have grown so much. You're every bit as strong and stubborn as your father was. Just remember, Marlo, that just because you can face the world on your own, that doesn't mean that you have to. I guess I guess you visit for a while. Do the crosswords, perhaps, together. I probably don't tell her everything about, you know, I don't tell her specifics about who's following me and why sort of thing. Just, but we act like normal people for a little bit, and it's nice. And, um... So she presumably goes to bed at an early hour. Yeah, one of the nurses kind of comes in and lets you know that, you know, she's not used to having this much conversation at, at once and that she needs to rest now and kind of shoes you out. Uh, Marlo? Yes. On your sheet, I would like you to mark mortality and erase one of the debts that you owe to your mother, Marianne. A whole debt. So is there anything else that you'd like to do before you leave the hospital? I, since I am still a little paranoid, probably, I'd, I'd want to um, do my thing, focus, channel, channel. I would want to channel just because I know something might happen on my way between here and home. Uh, okay, if you want to do your channeling... Um... Roll 2d6 plus spirit. Okay, that's an 8. So you, you get 3 holds, but uh, you do have to choose one of the uh, the options from this list. So 
you uh, take minus one ongoing until you rest. Uh, you suffer one harm, which is also armor piercing, or you mark corruption. Right. Um, I will probably... Ooh, I'm probably going to mark corruption, I think. Okay. Consider your gold star revoked. Oh, shit. Do I have to change that on my... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I might take away my gold star. I earned that, kind of. <laughs> you do get three hold, which you can plus one because of my focus. You get four hold. So I get four hold, which holds. you can spend on any any yes. spells you like. Um, as you make your way past the receptionist desk, however, you suddenly see something outside through the glass front doors of the hospital. Parked directly outside is a Black Hudson Commodore. And sure enough, you see the same man as before standing beside the vehicle with a cigarette in hand. He seems to have his eyes trained on the door as if he's waiting for someone to come out. Uh, what do you do? He, is he looking in my direction? Is he looking at me? It's hard to tell if he's seen you yet, but he's definitely yeah. staring at the door as if he's like waiting for you to come out. Right. Let's get you to... Oh, I was going to say read a bad situation, but I think that's Monster of the Week. Yeah. Let's get you to roll to escape a situation. Yes. So, 2d6 plus blood. Oof, it's a three. It's a mess. No, not good blood. Okay, I think before you get the chance to fully react and uh, get an opportunity to escape, uh, the driver of the Commodore does see you, and he locks eyes with you for a moment and just sort of grins. And then you see his eyes move, and he's now looking past you. Uh, to the receptionist, and then back down the hallway in the direction that you came from. And wordlessly, this communicates to you that he knows that even if you teleport or disappear through some other means, there's nothing to stop him from coming back here again. And now that you're here, he knows that there's something here that you want protected. Or rather, someone. Yeah, that was... Uh... That was that was my first impression, I think. <laughs> uh, what do you do? Uh, Shit, I'm gonna have to talk to him, I guess. Actually, yeah, let's. I just want to basically just just like just slouch myself into an alleyway and just kind of sit there, just kind of facing the street so like they can see me. But just like so, if they want to pull right up, they can. But if they go right past, then sure, we'll see what they do, sort of idea. But I'm gonna sit down. Okay, so you exit the hospital through the front door and make your way around the corner towards the nearest alley. And sure enough, after you've uh, been sitting there for only about a moment or so, you hear the sound of a car engine as the Commodore pulls up and stops right uh, in front of the alley as you hear the car door open. The driver gets out and... Um... He, he walks over to you kind of chuckling, and he says, Mr. Hosp, you certainly know how to play hard to get. And he extends out his hand. I'll shake his hand, I suppose. Not enthusiastically, but... Hmm. You know, for a second there, I was half expecting you to spit into my hand or cast a spell or some such, which, given the circumstances, is probably justified. My methods of contacting you have been, let's say, less than subtle. Uh, hell of a way to get a conversation. You know what? I'm I'm being rude. I know your name, and you don't know mine. My name is uh, Dominic Hoffman. I am a representative of the Strays, and I'm reaching out to you because my employer would uh, like to have a word if you were able to uh, make the time in your busy schedule. I guess I can squeeze you in. Who is this? Uh say boss, whatever the language you use. Alpha is the terminology that we use. All right, this alpha then. I can sense your apprehension, Mr. Hosp. I assure you that we would not be contacting you for any sort of nefarious purpose. We are simply in possession of a problem which we believe can only be solved by none other than the greatest wizard that Los Angeles has to offer. <laughs> right. Best wizard in this city. Fine, I'll, I'll come with you. But I can't promise anything, all right? Well, I can't promise anything either. So we'll just have to uh, we'll just have to see where things go. Play it by ear, I think is the expression. Would you like to roll to figure someone out? I would. Yes, that's a, that's an important thing. Let's do that. Four. 
Miss Jesus. You got nothing. This guy is is hard to read. An enigma. All right. Well, I'll get in. I'll get into the back. Thank you for cooperating, Mr. Haas. You know, I think this could be the start of a beautiful friendship. Malika, let's get back to you. All right. Okay, so we're picking up right where you left off. You are in Cyrus Cole's office. You just found the letter written to him by Alan Smithy. Uh, what do you do? It wouldn't really be a, a place of power, would it? Uh, I mean, as a, as a large movie studio, I yeah. think it would be. Yeah? I think it would be, yeah. yeah uh, gonna... Mark mortality, and then roll uh, 2d6 plus mortality. All right. Four. That's a mess. Uh, yeah, you um, you don't really get much of anything then. I ain't got uh, dick. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's not much I can do that I can think of other than going to talk to Alan Smithy. Okay, so you head back down to the set, and after a little bit of wandering around, you see the same uh, diminutive man that you saw before. It looks like he just got done yelling at somebody, and he's now just uh, pacing around the stage in a huff, just kind of muttering to himself. Uh, what do you do? Walk right on up to him. Is everything all right, Mr. Smithy? He turns and shoots you a glare. Um, I'm sorry, who are you supposed to be? Malachi Abrams, private detective. Oh, I see. So you're the famous detective that our PA was insisting that we should hire earlier. I wouldn't say famous. Well, you can go ahead and let her know that she can go ahead and chase all the ghosts she wants after we've wrapped production, and that your expenses will be coming out of her paycheck. We'll discuss who's paying for my services sometime. In the meantime, I'd like to ask a couple questions if I might. Well, I suppose if that gets you to leave any sooner, some of us, and he looks around at the crew that's just sort of milling around the area, are still trying to keep things on an orderly schedule. So if you want it, actually, since you're basically about to interrogate this guy, this might be a good opportunity to try to uh, figure someone out. So if you want to do that, that's just a 2d6 plus your mind stat. Eight. Succeeds partially. So, okay, so you hold two, and he holds one on you. And so while you're interacting with him, you can spend one of your hold to ask uh, one of the following questions. Uh, who's pulling your strings? What's uh, your character's beef with blank? What's your character hoping to get from blank? How could I get your character to blank? What does your character worry might happen? Or how could I put your character in my debt? I, uh, well, there's a, uh, I was told there was a, uh, the, the apparition scene here was the ghost of Hector Corazon. I was wondering if you might be able to fill me in on who that is. Hector Corazon? Well, just about everyone in Hollywood knows that name. Heck was a legend of the silent film era. He was THE legend. Even in a time before movies even had sound, he can make the lady swoon with just a look. But, you know what they say, the candle that burns twice as bright burns for half as long, and Heck was no exception. Fifteen years ago, while working on his latest film, The Swashbuckler of San Jose, Hector Corazon was mysteriously killed when a fire occurred in the screening room at the studio. Hector had requested to view the dailies in private, and, according to reports afterwards, something caused the nitrate film stock to spontaneously combust, taking down the whole building with him inside. Hell of a thing. As for our PA claiming that she's seen his ghost, well, uh, the poor girl's so starstruck she's probably just seeing what she wants to see, if I'm being honest. Well, whether or not she's starstruck, I think that gives her very little reason to lie to me. Well, while I can't deny strange things have been happening around here lately, I certainly wouldn't chalk it up to the supernatural. In light of recent events, it seems a lot more likely that whatever was happening around here was probably the work of gang activity. Probably rivals trying to get at Cyrus. God rest his soul. Cyrus was, was uh, mixed in with a couple gangs? Hey, allegedly. Allegedly. That's off the record. Uh, whatever Cyrus got up to on his off time no, makes no difference to me. Here at this studio, we're all one crew, one team, and one family. Oh, for uh, for valuing the team so much, you sure were eager to move into his office. Hey, don't get me wrong. Hearing the news about Cyrus this morning was devastating. Again, God rest his soul. But man, the show must go on, right? Somebody's got to keep the film running in his absence, and honestly, it might as well be the director. What exactly do you need to keep the film running? 
Ah, dear lord, I'm wearing so many hats on this production, you have no idea. I've got actors to corral, scripts to rewrite, shot lists to make, letters to send. Letters like the one found in your desk? Oh, the color just fades from his face. Uh, you haven't actually spent any of your hold yet, either. Not from what I can tell. <laughs> no, he's, he is he's just, just cracking. <laughs> he's <laughs> breaking down a meeting. <laughs> Mr. Smith, you have to understand, I'm not here to investigate a murder or otherwise mysterious death. I'm only here to investigate a haunting. Whether or not the murder is involved, that's none of my business. That's for someone else to investigate. I'm here for one job and one job only. Right, yes. <laughs> well, I... Of course. Um, has anyone ever told you it's rude to read another person's mail? It's funny, I didn't see any postage on it. And, uh, wondering now, you're out of producer. Who, uh, who is producing this now? There's, there's got to be someone uh, backing your work here. I guess I am uh, spending hold on this to figure out who's pulling his string. Well, I, I, I mean, news of Cyrus's death only reached us this morning, so, uh, of course, the studio's still working to find a replacement. However... Um, until they do so, I have, uh, graciously volunteered to handle all creative and budgetary matters myself. Um, this film is sort of my magnum opus, so, uh, I already have a fairly decent idea of what needs to be put into it. Wouldn't have been Cyrus's magnum opus? It can be two things. That could be one thing to two people. This, uh, very tense moment is suddenly interrupted as, Malachi, you suddenly feel a very strong, firm hand grasp you on the shoulder. You turn and see a, uh, tall, well-built, middle-aged man wearing a, uh, trench coat very similar to your own, as well as a trilby hat. He looks down at you and smiles and says, uh, well, hello there. Haven't seen your face on this set before. I don't suppose you're one of the extras. I'm just on the set for the day. Well, if you'll permit me to make a deduction, going off of your choice of garb, I take it you're something of a private dick? And? Well, I suppose it makes sense that our director would see fit to hire on a consultant of sorts, although, if I'm being honest, I think I've sort of been nailing this role so far. Isn't that right, Alan? And, and, and Smithy just kind of like looks back and forth between two, like not really sure what's going on, and just kind of like nods. Uh, tell me, what, uh, what are you investigating on the set? What's, what's your, what's the plot behind this? Without giving too much away, of course. Well, I'm sure you've no doubt heard of me, Sterling White, famous actor. As for my role in this particular film, I play the character Dirk Diamond, a renegade gumshoe who plays by his own rules and takes orders from no one. I see. Well, I suppose I would have a little bit of, uh, advice to give you from a standpoint of personal experience see my uh so far biggest case was uh investigating the death of another private detective who got in a little too deep a bit nosy with the wrong people just remember no matter uh no matter how much you think you're investigating a case the case might also be investigating you <laughs> oh he claps you on the back oh i am so using that Alan, we can put that in the script, right? And then he looks over at Alan Smithy, who just kind of, like, nods again. Mr. Smithy, you seem worried. <laughs> what could possibly have a man of your caliber worried? Spending another hold. Smithy opens his mouth to say something, but the actor, Sterling, immediately cuts him off again. Oh, I'm sure he's still feeling guilt over the passing of our dear friend Cyrus. I'm sure you've heard the news by now. Tragic, really. Last night, before Cyrus went home, I... Happened to walk in on the two of them in the middle of a particularly heated shouting match with each other. Oh, it's always so heartbreaking, the things we say that can't be taken back. Oh, well, in the end, I suppose all we can really do is just bravely soldier on. Speaking of, I believe that my break is just about over, so I will see you all back on set. And then he sort of saunters off back to the, uh, the constructed detective's office in the middle of this floor. And, um... Once he's gone, Smithy kind of looks at you, and he's like, Listen, I know how this looks, but I, I, I assure you I had nothing to do with the death of Cyrus Cole. I, I, <laughs> it's probably hard for you to believe. Believe me, I, 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 I know my way around a screenplay. I, I know foreshadowing when I see it, but trust me, this is... Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm honest when I'm saying that I, my hands are clean. 
uh, in in this case, and I, I'd really appreciate if you don't tell anyone about that letter. I only divulge what information I feel is necessary. So far, it's not. He immediately just breathes a sigh of relief. And so, Malachi, uh, Alan Smithy now owes you one debt. All right. Uh, what exactly does he owe me a debt for here? Uh, keeping quiet about the letter. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, no, nothing to worry for me, Mr. Smithy. After all, how could I expect you to possibly pay me if I'm giving away all your secrets? You are, after all, the producer of this set. All costs go through you. And I smirk a little bit at He kind of grimaces and, and looks at you, and uh, through grit teeth he says, uh, Come by my office later and I'll cut you a check. Certainly. Uh... One last thing before I go, Mr. Smithy. Do you know where a guy can get a cup of coffee around here? Patrick, let's check in on you next. Uh, sure. You are currently at a coffee shop. Actually, here's a question. When you're visible as a ghost, do you just look like an ordinary person? Uh, yeah, I like to think so. Okay, so like as long as like nobody gets too close and like touches you or anything, then like you'll just they'll just assume that you're just like a regular guy walking down the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I like to think. Patrick, you and Ducko are you're currently sitting on, each other's laps. on a. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to remember the word. You're at the uh, you're you're at the patio of a, a coffee shop in Chinatown, and right across the street from you is. A little antique shop with a faded sign um, that reads uh, Zhang's Antiques. And this is apparently the uh, joint that you and uh, Dako will be uh, heisting for your intended score. And uh, Dako is just walking you through the plan right now. So so what we're looking for is, is about an orb. Is it's an orb. It's, uh, it's about the size of... Uh, a regulation basketball, I guess. A regulation basketball, I. Uh, it's uh, uh, sort of uh, like a purplish magenta color, slightly translucent, um, and uh, you'll you'll know it when you see it because uh, you, you'll feel like a little a little bit of uh, electricity jolt through your fingers if you if you reach over and touch it. So what I was thinking was, we wait for the shop to close, right? Then I'll stand on lookout while you do your ghosty thing. You go in through the wall, grab the orb, get out, and uh, there we go. Bob's your uncle. Oh, well, that certainly sounds easy enough. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, uh, so uh, do, you have any, do you have any questions about, uh, you know, about the plan? I just want to make sure we're, we're crystal on this. Uh, how much money should I leave behind when I take the orb? I will leave that to your personal discretion. Okay. Not going to be a whole lot then. That's kind of the point of a heist. You're you're not really paying for what you steal. You do you do understand what what the word heist means, right? I've seen movies before. As uh, as you two are, are going over this plan, though, um, Patrick, you suddenly notice as uh, two cars suddenly pull in and stop right in front of the antique shop across the street, and then you watch as um, two figures get out of each car. And you see one of them just reel back and just, like, shatter the glass window on the side of the building with his fist. And then they all just kind of pile into the pile into the antique shop. Uh, what do you do? Oh, shite. I turn to Duck Ho and say, Ah, uh, is that part of the plan? Is what part of the... Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. What is happening? What is that? Who are those? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, do like can you do like a ghost thing and and like stop them? Well, I could certainly try. Okay, yeah, yeah. You do your ghost thing, and I'll do my dragon thing, and 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 uh um, just you know, go team. And he just kind of sprints down the street, just like, and and just like confused frenzy towards these people who are ransacking the antique store you're about to heist. Uh, what do you do? Waitress, uh, check please. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna take a moment to manifest. I am going to mark corruption to only choose one option, and I'm just gonna go for touch. So I am invisible and inaudible, but I can pick things up. 
Look at you, Mr. Corruption over here. Who knew that Patrick was the fucking darkest member of the of the party? He's literally a ghost. I don't know what you expected. <laughs> I would like to think of myself as a friendly ghost. <laughs> okay, so the chaos that's currently going on across the street kind of gives you enough of a distraction so you can just sort of slink off and disappear, basically. Meanwhile, as Doc Ho crosses the street towards the antique shop, uh, you see a large figure step out of one of the vehicles, presumably one of the getaway drivers, and he immediately draws a gun and points it at Doc Ho. Doc Ho just sort of like puts both hands in the air and goes, Hey, 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 wait, whoa, 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 hey a second. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Uh, just between you and me, I happen to be a dragon, so definitely not the kind of person you want to be fucking with right now. Uh, however, the driver of, with the gun doesn't seem to be paying much heed to this, as you see him uh, slowly start to pull back the hammer on the gun. Uh, what do you do? Can I try to take the gun from him? You know what? There should be a way to do that. I think take gun is under blood. <laughs> <laughs> so this would be a mislead distractor trick. All right. So roll 2d6 plus mine. Uh, for me, it's actually spirit, because I have the move won't be ignored. Well then. Oh, that's a sick 10, brah. You get to choose three of the following options. You create okay. an opportunity. You expose a weakness or flaw. You confuse them for some time. And or you avoid further entanglement. I definitely go for create confusion for some time. It's like a funny invisible man bit. I'm like Claude Rains. I'm going to create confusion. I'm going <laughs> to... What was there? Make an opening? Was that one of those? Uh, yeah, you can create an opportunity. Great opportunity. I'll do that and prevent further entanglements. Those three. What do you think that would look like in this case, then? I like to think I like take the gun from him <laughs> and I, like juggle it around, and he's like, "What's going on?" And then Ducko slugs him in the head and knocks him out. Okay, yeah. So Ducko's just like, "Oh yeah, you see that? I'm controlling the gun with my dragon mind powers." And, um, like, as he's distracted, Daco just suddenly reels back and kicks him in the nards. And then you both just, like, duck into an alley while he's, while he's distracted. O okay, so that did not go as expected. Um, we have a gun now, so that's something. Uh, I'm pretty sure there was, like, three more dudes in there who probably also have guns. So, um, I'm not really sure where to take this. I had to mark corruption to not be heard. I don't know if I want to undo that so easily. Uh, uh. Wait, Pat? Pat, are you still there? I'm still holding the gun. It's like floating in the air. Seriously? I think Zako generally, like, genuinely thought that he was using mind powers there. <laughs> oh, he's not a smart dragon. <laughs> Through a series of concise gestures, I'm going to communicate to him that I want to know what his intentions are for our plan now. <laughs> Well, um, okay, you know, maybe we're jumping to assumptions. Maybe they're here for something other than the orb. And then it's just as he says that, you hear, uh, like, a voice from out in front of the, uh, the antique store go, We have the orb! Go, go, go! <laughs> okay. I'm gonna poke my invisible, inaudible head around the corner and see if it's, like, if it's, like, the orb matches the description of the orb he gave me earlier. Uh... Yeah, you put your head out and you see one of these burly figures jump into the car and under his shoulder, like scooped under his arm, <laughs> you see that he does have a purpley magenta translucent uh, orb about the size of a regulation size basketball. Oh, shit. I communicate this to Duck Ho through a series of clever gestures. Can you stop swinging that gun around, Pat? It's giving me anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll appear visible again. Okay, so they have the orb. Uh, we don't know who they are, or why they took it, but the good news is, we can still tail them, right? I've been led to believe that's the case, I- uh, Okay, sweet, I parked my moped out behind the coffee shop, come on, hurry. Should I keep the gun? Yes, uh, that's a good thing to have. Perhaps you should hold the gun, I'm not corporal. Yeah, you know what, I will time. hold the gun. I give Great. him the gun. When did this become whose line is it anyway? <laughs> <laughs> So, Kato, yes. the most recent thing you did was you went down to the burnt mansion of Cyrus Cole. The burnt mansion, and I found a long black feather. You yes. have this feather. Hi. You, you don't know the exact origin of it uh, yourself, but you do know that it is definitely demonic in origin. Well, I'm gonna go home. 
I I'm swept, right? Like I just worked a full shift. I haven't got a wink of sleep yet. I'm going to hell home. And you don't have to go into work the next morning because no. Darlene owes you a debt. Oh, right. Yeah, so I'm just I'm just gonna go home. I'm gonna like grab a beer and pass the fuck out on my on my couch. So you arrive at your apartment and immediately make a beeline for the fridge, which I can only assume is fully stocked with beer at the moment. And as you grab a, grab a bottle and pop off the top, you pause for a second as you notice that the hiss of carbonation is lasting just a little bit longer than it should. Of course it does. And you watch as thick black smoke begins to billow out of the mouth of the bottle. All right, I immediately slam my beer on my counter and take three steps back. <laughs> Hello, Kato. I... hang on, I can't remember what my voice is supposed to sound like. One second. <laughs> What do you want? Well, you know, I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd just stop by to borrow a cup of why haven't you found the murderer yet? All right, you can tell me this. And I, like, pull out um, the long black feather from within the inside of my um, leather jacket pocket, and I place it on the counter. Do you recognize that, or do you know where that comes from? Unfortunately, I do. That feather is a calling card of the demon Malfas. Those who receive his patronage sprout feathery wings when they assume their demon form. In other words, it would appear that Malfas is responsible for the tainted that paid a visit to our dear friend Mr. Cole. Well, that would explain why I found it among the ashes. I suppose now the question remains, was this tainted sent by Malfas himself? Or was the little firebug acting independently? Why aren't you sure about that? Malfas is a master of subtlety. The way in which Cole was murdered would be far too... theatrical for his liking. No, it seems far more likely that this was a... What do you humans call it? A crime of passion? <sighs> and of course, you're not going to divulge any other useful information. You're just going to let me run around the city? I never said I was all-knowing. If that's what you're looking for, my dear, perhaps you should try the church down the street. Yeah, I figured as much. A dick. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've ruined the taste of my beer. Thank you very much for that. Did I ruin it or did I make it better? Um, you've definitely ruined it, Liz. Like your like ass end is still in the in the cup, like genie. Okay, like I'm not touching that after. It was a Bud Light. If anything, I think I did you a favor. Yeah. Okay. You know, you can just take it when you leave. That'd be great. Smell you later, and you watch as the smoke just sort of recedes back into the bottle and uh, disappears from sight. Excellent. I'll grab another one and go have a seat on the couch. <laughs> I guess, Marlo, we left you on a bit of a cliffhanger. Yes. So after a long and uh, mostly silent car ride, Dominic finally uh, brings the car to a halt at what appears to be your destination. You have arrived at a large warehouse overlooking the docks. While the warehouse itself appears to be in poor condition, you do notice that the parking lot is mostly filled with uh, newer and more sort of well-maintained models of cars, much like Dominic's own Commodore. Speaking of which, Dominic opens the door to your side and says, well, here we are and gestures for you to step out of the car. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a step forward. As you approach the warehouse, Dominic takes a step in front of you before opening the door and says, um, <clears throat> allow me to formally introduce you to the leader of the strays. Marlo Hosp, meet Alpha. And as the door opens, you see that this warehouse is filled with wolves. Jeez, how many wolves are you talking? Uh, somewhere in the ballpark of between 30 to 40 wolves. Jesus. <laughs> Fuck. Some of them are sitting on the bare concrete floor of the warehouse. Others have perched up on top of crates and boxes that are littered around. But as Dominic leads you inside, every single one of them is currently staring directly at you. At the far end of the warehouse, you see that several boxes have been stacked up in sort of a crude shape resembling a chair, or rather a throne. And seated on this throne, you see a woman in a black dress with fingerless elbow-length gloves currently smoking from an ornate cigarette holder. She has long black hair with a single white streak running down the side and three diagonal scars running directly across her face. Marlo Haas, we've been expecting you. 
Dominic uh, leads you through the group of wolves towards Alpha's throne and then uh, just takes his place at her right hand as she speaks. So tell me, Marlo, how's your mother been holding up recently? She's fine, thanks. Well, that's certainly a relief. I've always believed that there's a wealth of knowledge and experience to be gleamed from our elders. Wouldn't you agree? Why don't you just tell me what you want? You're not going to get any further by scaring me. Don't get the wrong idea, Marlo. I certainly have no intention of getting what I want through intimidation. If it would make you feel more comfortable, I could dismiss my subordinates so we can continue this conversation in private. She wants the food? What? <laughs> uh... Doggy style. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> okay, I think it's time to mute Allie. <laughs> uh, your beasts don't really bother me. We can speak here. We're fine. I prefer the word friends over beasts. Thank you. Whatever you say, Mrs. Alpha. Just Alpha. Right, right. Can I roll to figure someone out? Let's go for it. That's relevant. Go for <laughs> it. <laughs> like... <laughs> okay. Actually, it's Miss Alpha. Because <laughs> 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 she likes to dominate. <laughs> so that's an eight? Madame, yes, an eight. Yes, so that means that you hold two, but she also gets to hold one on you as well. Right. Cool. As for what I want, Mr. Haas, but I'm afraid that's something of a loaded question. Like so many others before me, I came to the city with a dream. A dream that one day I might make this place a home for both myself and for my family. But, as I soon discovered, as large as this city is, it seems as though there's... Never quite enough of it to go around. The parks belong to the Fae, the oracles control the docks and airports, and everything else belongs to the ghosts. So let me ask you, Marlo, what does that leave for the rest of us? The gutters, the back alleys where we're forced to fight tooth and nail for whatever scraps happen to get thrown our way? No, I'm afraid my tastes are far too discerning for that. I want to carve out a home for myself and my family here in Los Angeles. And when I say family, that can include you, Marlo. You agree to help us, and we can provide the protection that you so desperately desire. I have no need for a pack. Thank you very much. I appreciate the offer. I appreciate that you appreciate. But what is it you need from me to bring you what you want? Is that a thing I can... Yes. Oh yeah, what's your character hoping to get from my, yeah, from my influence or my thing? Yeah, that, I'll spend a hold for that. Marlo, I'm going to be honest with you. What we need from you is something that we've attempted in the past, but the previous wizard was, shall we say, uncooperative. And while I can't promise any results, I certainly hope you have more of an open mind than he did. Uncooperative is an interesting way to put it, but seeing as how I don't really have much of a choice... That's the spirit. Hmm. I'm sure at this point it would come as no surprise to you that myself and my associates, we are all werewolves. And as werewolves, our supernatural power is tied directly to the phases of the moon. It is our greatest strength, but also our greatest limitation. But I believe through the use of a specific artifact, we can remove that limitation to give us the strength of the full moon at all times, regardless of its actual phase in the sky. My associates have already located the artifact, but we still need a powerful wizard to perform the ritual. And that's where you come in. With your help, Marlo, we may finally reach our full potential. That certainly sounds altruistic, don't you think? From a perspective, sure. So tell me, Marlo, if you don't want our protection, what can we offer in exchange for your services? Uh, this is her spending her hold on you now. Well, I'm assuming your first offering is not allowing harm to come to my mother. Fine, that's a pretty good start. I have no intention of joining your path, of joining you. Like, that's not in my interests. I don't work for you, I don't work for anybody. Not for us, Mr. Hosp, but with us as equals you've got my cooperation she she gets up from her pile of crates and kind of gingerly steps over a couple of sleeping wolves as she struts over to you 
and she extends one black gloved hand and says, uh, so it sounds like we have a deal. I suppose we do. All right. Well, Marlo, you just struck a deal with someone dark and powerful, so mark corruption. And as you shake her hand from outside, you hear the sound of car engines revving as uh, Alpha looks past you towards the door and says, well, I guess they're right on time. Patrick. Yeah. After tailing the getaway vehicles from a safe distance, Daco brings his moped to a stop when you reach the docks. You see both of the vehicles from the antique store are currently parked outside of a warehouse, and it looks like the occupants have already gone inside. What do you do? All right, Daco, what's the plan for this one? Well, okay, so here's what I'm thinking. Um, I have a gun. I. That's as far as my plan goes. It's a good start. Uh, you know, if, if there's anything... You'd like to contribute? I can turn invisible. Right, yes. Use that. You turn invisible. I will go to the warehouse door and make a distraction. You sneak in and take the orb, and then we get out of there. All right. I'll do it. I turn invisible. One question. You. What? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 What's your question? <laughs> regulation <laughs> size, you said, right? Regulation size basketball? Yes, regulation size. Okay. Does this count as an intimate moment? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think it does. <laughs> okay. Yes. Read out your, your intimacy move as the specter. When you share a moment of intimacy, physical or emotional, with another person, you hold one. Whenever they get into trouble, you can spend your hold to be there. <laughs> That sounds like it could come in handy here. <laughs> come in handy. I, I wasn't going to say anything, but I, should, I guess I should have known you would. So you turn invisible. And I turn invisible. You, you head I out. Can still towards, be heard this time. And you make your way towards uh, the warehouse. Surreptitiously. Back to, back to Marlo. Yeah. Uh -oh. From inside the warehouse, you watch as four armed figures, presumably werewolves in human form, step inside. The one in the lead appears to be carrying some sort of interesting orb-shaped object. Can you describe the object for us? Yes. Well, it's about the size of a regulation size basketball. Okay, you already know where this is going. <laughs> and Marlo, you watch as the werewolf holding the orb just wordlessly approaches Alpha and gently places the orb into her waiting hands. Well, I suppose there's no sense in waiting around now, is there? And with a snap of her fingers, all the wolves around you suddenly get up and disperse. And as the space around you opens up, you suddenly realize that you and Alpha are both currently standing in the center of a large circle that's been painted on the warehouse floor. Tell me, Marlo, in your studies, have you ever heard of a creature known as an Imugi? In Korean folklore, an Imugi is said to be a dragon in its larval state. Incomplete. Imperfect. But if an emugi is able to catch an orb as it falls from heaven, then it will transform into a fully fledged dragon and thus unlock its true potential. By the same token, I believe that by harnessing this orb we can unlock our own potential as well, so that our strength will no longer be bound by the phase of the moon. Jack, is this orb the fucking Yugiju? I'm surprised you know what that is. I've seen the movie Dragon Wars! Oh, true. <laughs> I like this. I like where this is going. This is cool. Yeah, hey guys, I'll be right back. I just gotta go watch a one hour, 47 minute movie so I know exactly <laughs> what the fuck is going on. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a schlocky monster movie. If you like that, it's good fun. 28% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's a good sign. <laughs> Alpha hands off the orb to you, Marlo, and as she does so, you feel a tingling sensation in your fingers as you take it, like built up static electricity. The sun is setting as we speak, and soon the full moon will hang in the sky once again. All you have to do, Marlo, is just channel your powers directly into the orb as if it were your focus, and we'll take care of the rest. And you watch as the other werewolves, most of whom have now assumed their human form, all gather around and stand on the outside perimeter of the circle. Alpha smiles at you and says, um, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm gonna go to the center of the circle then, I suppose, and do that thing. It's just the same as channeling? Uh, yes. Patrick, I think at this point you've made your way into the warehouse and you've kind of caught the tail end of what's about to happen. 
I'm going to interfere the shit out of this. Holy shit, inter-character interaction. Ooh. Yeah, here we go. Only took us two and a half fucking sessions, but we how, did it. How do? How interact? Okay, so how this works is Marlo's making a roll with Spirit to channel energy into the orb. While he does that, Patrick is going to make an opposing roll with his faction to get in the way of that roll. Okay, it's a 10+. plus. Already? I don't have to roll. It's part of my won't-be-ignored move. When you get in the way of someone, treat your oh, roll fuck. as a 10+, plus without rolling. Oh, shit. Jeez. Okay. So, Marlo, you have to roll your channel at a minus two. And this is going to work different than your regular channel. So this isn't going to give you hold. This is going to determine the success of the ritual. And I, uh, just to clarify, do I still have my holds from before I got in the car? Uh, This is a new scene, so technically no. All right. But this channel won't go towards your holds. Like, if you want to make another channel in this scene, I'll allow it. This is a custom move. But so why, why do I take a minus two? Because uh, Patrick is getting in your way somehow. Oh, right. So he just actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to try to do a, a, a flying frog splash onto him to interrupt the proceedings. Yeah, that works every time. <laughs> 60% of the time, that works every time. Marlo? <laughs> I was just about to say that. Roll 2d6 plus spirit minus two. Yeah, which is nothing. So six, it's a miss. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> So you begin to channel energy into the orb, and as you do so, the circle under your feet begins to glow with an eerie red light. However, this is quickly interrupted as 90 pounds of invisible Irishman plows into you from above, causing you to drop the orb to the floor, and the red light in the circle suddenly goes out. That's what it sounds like. (laughs) And right as, as, right as that happens... Uh, Doc Ho kicks open the door at the end of the warehouse and just shouts, Nobody move! I've got a gun! And then sees what's going on in here and goes, Um, just kidding! <laughs> <laughs> Alpha uh, looks over at Marlo and goes, Marlo, what is the meaning of this? <laughs> Don't look at me. I'm assuming I'm too busy to talk to him. I'm being attacked by, or knocked over by a ghost. Taste me, Irish Fury! <laughs> this isn't really a time for a conversation. <laughs> Alpha's eyes glow bright yellow as she lets out a snarl. Called for backup, didn't you? Oh, I knew you couldn't be trusted. Everyone, grab the wizard before he gets away with the orb. So, Patrick and Marlo, I need you both to roll to escape a situation. Shit. I rolled a nine. Two. Can't do shit that way. So, Marlo, realizing the wolves have turned on you, you turn tail to get out of there. But as you do so, one of the werewolves that's still in their wolf form lunges out at you. As you feel a mouthful of fangs sink into your upper calf, you fall to the ground and take one harm. Oh, shite. I don't like that. Well, oh. shit. Man, if I had any holds. Uh, Patrick, though, you rolled a nine, which means that you have to choose two from the following list in order to get away. So you suffer harm during your escape. You end up in a dangerous situation of another kind. You leave something important behind. You owe someone a debt for your escape, or you give in to your base nature and mark corruption. I have to choose two. I'll say I'll owe someone a debt for it, because why not? I'm already up to my eyeballs in. And I'll mark corruption for it. Okay. Okay, at this point, the wolves are already whipped up into a frenzy. You see Alpha and the other ones that were in their human form have already begun to turn as you hear the sounds of cracking bones and tearing fabrics and canine snarls. Suddenly, two gunshots echo through the empty warehouse as Alpha, caught mid-transformation, is knocked back by two bullets piercing through her shoulder. All of the wolves around her immediately stop their own transformations and rush to her aid as Patrick, you turn and see Doc Ho firing blindly into the crowd of wolves trying to create some suppressing fire to allow you to escape. As I run by, I stop and look down at Alpha and I say, Looks like every dog has its day. Oh, shit. (laughs) Oh, do I have the orb with me? I don't know, do you? I, I assume I would have gone for it if it was close. I didn't lose anything important from my escape. Yes, well, by leaving Marlo here, you are leaving him in a scene of victimization. I suppose I am. So you can abandon him here if you want, but you have to mark another point of corruption in order to do so. If I help with his getaway, do I have the orb? That's what is important here. <laughs> Does Marlo have the orb right now? It's on the floor. Probably closer to Marlo because you smacked it out of his hands, but... I'm going to go back for the orb. I'm going to... I didn't realize it was him until now. So I'm going to say it's him. I'm going to turn to him. But like, oh, Marlo, it's nice to see you again. How's your ma? <laughs> Jeez. Uh, now is not the time. <laughs> oh, right, right. Marlo, would you like to channel or... Yes. 
Yes, I would. Which is spirit. Nine. Which is hold three plus one and choose one from these things below again. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna take minus one on going. I think until I rest because this is a harrowing. This is a harrowing situation. <laughs> that makes sense to me. And yeah, I have I have four holds. Can I use one immediately? Uh, yeah. yeah. Why not? Go for it. Yeah, I'm just gonna teleport out of here. I'm fucking out. Okay. Probably just back to where I got out of the car, roughly, because that's where I... I'm probably familiar with the docks, but it's not my favorite, but it's not the place I don't hang out here, necessarily. Can you take another person with you? Uh, as far as I know, I cannot. Are you taking the orb? Did you give Patrick the orb? Well, he was grabbing the orb. I'm going for the orb. The orb. He went for the orb, and I'm just, like, I'm just out of here, then. I can't stay. And he's a ghost. I don't have to worry about him being grabbed, you know? <laughs> he's a ghost. Yeah. It's I, like how, I like how last session we started off, it's like, who do you trust the least? And Marlo's like, I trust Patrick the least, because I don't know what a ghost could do. He could attack me from behind, and that's exactly what I did. <laughs> Next yeah. scene, I stabbed Kato with a knife. Okay, you know what? <laughs> you, uh, you, you did successfully roll to escape, so I'm not going to like undo that, because you came back to hell, Marlo. So, I'm going to say that you... Make it in... You, you get, you, after Marlo teleports away, you... Also managed to escape. I'll, I'll go invisible with the orb and just run out. Oh, I'm assuming I owe Daco a debt for the escape. Yeah, fortunately, Alpha being wounded uh, bought you and Daco both enough time to get out while they were distracted. And Marla, you said that you just teleported to the outside of the warehouse, basically? Yeah, just about like where I got out. Okay, so you teleport to the exterior parking lot and... You know what? Just for the hell of it, I'm going to say one of these cars is currently unlocked. It seems that Dominic was anticipating the need to make a quick getaway if things went wrong with the ritual, so he left the keys of the ignition to the Commodore. What a dumbass. Like, <laughs> Dominic. Fucking <laughs> yeah, I guess. Hijack it. I'm taking a car. Yes, I don't drive very often. I... Arlo, wait for us! Oh, shit. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess I guess I'll wait. I'll wait for him. Yeah, yeah. Marlo, you watch as Patrick and some dude in a leather jacket you don't recognize pile into the Commodore as well. But not too far behind them, you see a, a wolf, larger and more battle scarred than the rest, bounding out of the warehouse door towards you, with several other wolves not too far behind. What do you do, Marlo? Do something. Well, I guess I could shoot at them with my gun. I forgot I have a gun. Okay, roll to unleash an attack, but with uh, minus one since you still have minus one ongoing. Too bad I roll with blood, which is already a minus one. I cast gun. Okay, I unleashed with my snub nose forty four out the window. Whoa! Ooh, nice. Oh how? Jeez, you I got a the perfect twelve minus two. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so oh. on a hit, you inflict harm as established. So, how much harm does your revolver do? It is two harm. So you inflict two harm, and you can choose either to inflict terrible harm, which means, like, one more harm than usual, or mm. you can take something from the people you're attacking. Uh, it'll be the extra harm. Okay, so like an absolute badass, you just shatter the driver's side window with the butt of your gun because you don't have time to roll it down, and then take aim, and you shoot, and you hit the battle-scarred wolf leading the pack right in the eye. Ooh. And as he goes down, he sort of rolls as he hits the ground, causing the wolves that are behind him to sort of trip over him. And so the chain reaction that happens as a result of this uh, temporarily prevents the wolves from closing the distance between them and you, which gives you time to turn the key as the engine of the Commodore roars to life. What do you do? Uh, drive. I can get out of here. Why get in the car first? Is that not roll to escape again? No, you're 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 yeah, not free at this point. Place, I have to mention. All right. Cool. No, you're out of there. You you succeeded. It's not silver. He'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, three harm is still a lot. That's a lot. So, yeah. Mm. yeah. Cool. Marlo, what were you doing in there? Uh, it's a long story. <laughs> Let's fast forward to the following day with Kato. Hey, -o. it's the it's the start of a new day. You don't have any new leads, as it were. What would you What would you like to do? Well, I'm really living only really between my apartment and the speakeasy, so I guess I'll go to the bar and see how everything's doing there. Okay, so you arrive at the speakeasy, and when you get there, you see Darlene wiping down one of the tables with a clean rag, and she looks up at you and goes, Kato, I thought Rocky gave you the day off. 
But I just thought, you know, might as well come in and see the regs. And I have to look for some intel, so might as well work some people. Oh, sounds exciting. Uh, anything that you can talk about, or? Um... Why don't you drink a tall glass and shut the fuck up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would, but I need to... To talk to like specific people about specific things. Look, it's just look, oh man. So my boss basically just wants me to like play a real life clue board game, and he's making me do the run around and making it seem like it's some freaking party. But uh, it's really boring and kind of rude. So, well, I didn't understand a word of that, but I'll try not to pry. As long as you're here, can I get you something on the house? Uh, absolutely. That'd be great. Sorry, what time is it? Doesn't matter. <laughs> mm, guess not. She pours you a glass of whiskey and slides it across the uh, across the table to you. And um, as you're sitting at the bar, uh, in walks Rocky Ford, and he looks over at you and he's like, "Well, hey, what are you still doing here?" Oh, like you would want to get rid of me, Rocky? Don't worry about me. I'm not on the clock. All right, fair enough. Well, I guess uh, whatever you do on your free time is up to you. I'll be in the other room if you need anything. And then he steps back out. And as soon as Rocky steps out, uh, another figure steps in. He appears to be a taller, older man. My style. <laughs> with just a little bit of gray in his hair, dressed in a trench coat and trilby hat. As he takes a seat at the bar, he looks around and says, Ah, oh, well, isn't this place quaint? Bartender, I'd like an old-fashioned over here. I, uh, I chuckle and, um, recompose myself as I take a swig of my whiskey, and I... I look at him and I blotch his attire and I, and I say, so uh, are you a detective or? Oh, no, no, no. I merely play a detective in an upcoming film. Sterling White, the pleasure is all yours. So uh, you just walk around in your attire then? Like you don't change into regular clothes? Method acting, my dear, method acting. While working on a film, I always try and fully immerse myself in the character that I'm playing on the screen. Hence why I'm here at this rather dingy establishment, because this is the kind of bar that my character would frequent. Uh-huh. No, I, I totally understand that, because, like, uh, a detective is just so, how do you say, and I, like, turn around and I lean one arm the bar and I, like, have my drink in the other and I'm kind of trying to, like, not, like, overly flirt with him, but just kind of give him the sense that somebody is interested in him, because clearly he's looking for attention. And just kind of say, um, like, a je ne sais quoi, per se. Uh, I would like you to roll to mislead, distract, or trick. Okay, I can That's 2d6 do that. plus mind. A, I partially succeed. Uh, what did you get? With an 8. I got an, I got eight. an 8. Sorry, yeah. Okay. So you get to choose two of the following options. Uh, you mm -hmm. create an opportunity, you expose a weakness or flaw, you confuse them for some time, or you avoid further entanglement. I feel like he has information that I might need, so... You would like to create an opportunity then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of want to see where this guy takes me. I want to go down this rabbit hole. So, um, yeah, so I'll do the first one. Um, and then my second one would probably be just to confuse them a little bit, because I want to see if I can catch him off guard. He sort of looks at you and says, You know, you seem somewhat familiar. Are you an actress, perchance? Uh, only in dreams. Well, that must be where I remember you from, then. And he laughs. Meanwhile, Darlene just kind of looks over at you and makes, like, a gagging face. I'll, I'll pity chuckle with him. So what brings someone like you to a place like this? Oh, I, uh, I work here. It's just my day off. You work at a place like this? Well, forgive me for saying so, but going from your cadence, I just assumed that you were a performer as well. Uh, I'm a performer of different tasks, you could say. <laughs> God, that wasn't vaguely sexual. <laughs> hey, I'm, Anything I, you'd uh, care to divulge? Uh, that involves another drink, hun. Very well. Barkeep, another round. And at this point, I think Darlene knows you well enough to know that you're working some sort of con, so she just pours two more whiskeys and uh, leaves you to it. Yeah. So... You know, as you work as a detective, have you ever worked, like, a murder case before? Well, I'm not an actual detective, but as misfortune would have it, a colleague of mine actually did pass away recently from 
what is suspected to be foul play. Really? And I take like a step closer to him and I kind of just, you know, continue to play that cozying up, getting to know him thing. I'm sure you've heard the news about the passing of Cyrus Cole by now. Horrible thing to happen. If you ask me, it seems as though that studio is truly cursed. Why, it was only 15 years ago that the exact same thing happened to poor Hector Corazon. I'm sure you've heard of him as well. Oh, of course. Yes, everyone's heard of him. <laughs> you know, once upon a time, back in my theater days, I was actually Hector's understudy. That was, of course, before either of us got our big break in the film industry. Fascinating. So that's why you're so handsome. Um, yeah. Kato, why don't you roll to figure someone out? Oh, okay. I was going to also probably roll to persuade the NPC to let me go back to his studio so I can sneak Actually, it out. Actually, yeah, you can do that <laughs> as well. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like looking at the basic moves list. I'm like, mm, I kind of want to persuade him to let me come to the studio. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, that would be 2d6 plus heart. And I got an eight! Partially successful. Hey, hey. All right. So I just say, you know, why don't we work out a bit of a deal? Because I've always wanted to be on a movie set. So I, now just hear me out. But I'm thinking that if I let you come behind the scenes with me tonight at the bar, can you maybe give me a tour around the studio and get my name in there? Oh, I'm just, I feel so horrible for Rocky right now because I'm cheating on him. But, uh... <laughs> well, I suppose a brief tour might help me take my mind off poor Cyrus. Why don't we make our way over to Bulkhead Studios after this round? See? So I just chug the rest of my drink like a classy lady that I am and um, put the glass down and I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go when you are. He looks at your empty glass in surprise and says, uh... Well, if you're that eager, then by all means, let's go raise some hell. Okay, now Malachi. Hey. It is now the second day of your investigation. Uh, I assume that you return to your apartment for a night of getting as little sleep as possible to stave off the visions, but it is now a new day, so what do you do? Uh, have I heard any news from yesterday? Um, about the Corazon slash Cyrus Cole case, or... Let me specify, have I... Well, <laughs> specify and still be general. Have I heard any news about the goings-on in the rest of the city from yesterday? You heard some reports that there were gunshots down at the docks last evening, but when the police arrived on the scene, everyone involved had already fled. Um, other than that, nothing of interest. The only thing I can think of to do is to call or otherwise contact probably patrick who are you gonna call ghost <laughs> so patrick and marlo i assume that you two already parted ways after the events of last night after disposing of the car i suppose so let me get this straight marlo someone approaches you on the street and offers you a deal offering you everything you've ever wanted and you just go for it oh that's very irresponsible you should never do that <laughs> This is the guy who drank whiskey <laughs> sitting out <laughs> and died. Were you not listening like a minute ago and I explained to you after I visited my mother and they were like, oh, I know, I segued up past all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What time frame are we in? Because we're moving in like three different time frames here. Uh, I think yeah, this I is know. morning as well. I think that all the stuff with the uh, with the warehouse happened the night before, and now it's the following morning. I guess we drove around for a while until we feel like felt like we weren't being chased anymore. I would have been introduced to the dragon guy. I guess I would have been like, "Who the fuck is this?" I don't know. Oh, this is me, mate, Daco. It's uh, Daco, but yes, that, that yes, I am a dragon. He's the dragon, right? If if they finished following us, I would have driven them wherever the hell they wanted to be driven, basically. Then I would have just tossed the car and then... You can't get rid of us that easily. <laughs> well, here, the people are going to be trying to kill me. Like, I'm, I'm out of here. And they're going to be coming for us, too! You're going to drag it? I don't know. My mother might get murdered, or I might get murdered or something. I can't... I gotta go. I gotta, I gotta watch her, basically, be nearby. I guess what I'm trying to ask is, Patrick, are you currently at the Flaherty residence or no? Well, I think I would have asked Daco, now that we've got the orb, what does he want to do with it? Well, um, Pat, can you can you keep a secret? I could try. I when I say I'm a dragon, I'm not exactly like a hundred percent dragon yet. I was a little uh, confused by the lack of fangs and wings and 
sharpity bits on you. Yeah, very few uh, sharpie bits here, unfortunately. But uh, this orb is supposedly supposed to hold the secret of how to become a true dragon. I kind of, I kind of assumed that, like, as soon as I just had it in my hands, it would be sort of like a bam, instant dragon sort of situation. But uh, I guess not. I guess I don't really know how this thing works. But uh, and if I'm being really honest, um, if our heist had gone off, I probably would have just uh, left you high and dry after taking the orb and running off. But you know, I I guess after all the shit that we just went through, I kind of want to do right by this. So, yeah, I owe you one, Pat. So, Patrick, Mark, uh, Wild, if you haven't already, and Daco now owes you a debt. Oh, sweet. About fucking time. <laughs> and he goes on his way. Well, Are I you? I would, I would go back home after that. Okay. Okay, so you return home, and the following morning, while Francis and Flora are both at work, you receive a call from Malachi. Uh, good morning to you. Who is this? Patrick. It's Malachi. Oh, Malachi. How you doing? I'm busy and tired. Always tired. Yeah, that sounds about the about same as always for you. If you have the time, I'd like to speak to you in person. Oh well, you don't, don't have to check me schedule. And I look at a, I look at a calendar where nothing's marked on it. It's like oh, I could I could squeeze you in. I think yeah. All right, uh, let's meet at coffee shop on Street Road. You know the place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the best coffee shop. <laughs> wait, wait, the one on Street Road or the one on Road Street? Street Road. The one okay. on Road Street sucks. It, it runs. It, it crosses over with Boulevard Lane. Yeah, yeah. Not to be confused yeah. with Boulevard Boulevard. No, no, no. <laughs> One it's second while I look up a map of Los Angeles. It's right past Crescent Drive. Real fucking A-plus effort on the improv tonight, guys. <laughs>